So, first order of business, I want to say thank you so much for having this space. It's really wonderful that you have it. The whole idea of the International Association of Near Death Studies, as I understand it and have come to grow and love and speak at some of their events, is it's a place of spirituality where you can come and express yourself something that individually happened to you as an experience. Why do that? Partially it's because science isn't really allowed to, let's call it that, allowed to examine the personal experience. Science in general looks at data. So when you do the study of near-death experiences as Dr. Grayson has done at University of Virginia, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Grayson, many of you are, but his research is based on post interviews. Somebody had an experience and then they catalog what happened. Did you see a light? Did you see a person? Etc. Etc. And that's how data comes into existence. However, in this space, people are allowed to speak about their experiences. Something that personally happened to them. Whether it's an out-of-body experience, whether it was an LSD experience, ayahuasca, as we've heard. Um, no, I haven't done that. Um, or whether it was a near-death event, something where they found themselves somewhere else. And in the history of our science uh, thought, those things have been called, what? Paranormal, abnormal, supernormal, outside of normal, just to the left of normal. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to point out, it's kind of obvious, that if something happens to everybody, or it happens consistently, then it's no longer abnormal, it's normal. So, in my case, I'm gonna give you just a very brief, um, I know you guys aren't that familiar with my work, but just a brief introduction to my journey. I, I a friend of mine, passed away. That's where this began. <laughs> Died in my arms back in 1996, and then she started showing up in my apartment, either visually or I could hear her saying things to me. Uh, and it was it was a different version of who I knew. It's like a younger version of her, but I knew it was her. And at the time, growing up as I had, I grew up in Chicago, and I remember <laughs> saying to my dad, the architect at one point, you know, do ghosts exist? And he said, no, there's no such thing. And I took that as gospel. <laughs> Um, I, I realize now that the word ghost is a misnomer. The idea of a ghost, as we perceive that, is somebody who's dead. But if you just think about the logic of that for one second, if somebody's still communicating with you that's no longer on the planet, that means they're still alive. If they can give you new information, okay? Science kind of looks at this from the idea of cryptomnesia. If you hear something, you see something, you know somebody, or the Jungian unconscious, somehow you're tapping into the memory that somebody else had, and you're imagining, all here in the head, that you're hearing, seeing, sensing your loved one. Well, that's not in the data. What is in the data is that people don't die, they continue to exist. And not only do they continue to exist, but they go back home. That their consciousness from here returns home. And the reason I can say that, <laughs> with the amount of, it sounds like I know what I'm talking about, but with that kind of, because I've been researching this for over a dozen years. I filmed over 50 people under deep hypnosis talking about the afterlife. Um, and all of them say the same things about the journey, consistently. My first book, Flipside, started with 12 people. Uh, and I presented those cases to the University of Virginia, Bruce Grayson and Dr. Jim Tucker, who was the person in charge of reincarnation there. And Ed and Emily Kelly, PhD, we all sat around one day and we went over this research. And I pointed out, they pointed out that hypnosis isn't considered a valid scientific tool. I pointed out that 
whether it was a valid tool or not, if people are saying the same things consistently across the planet about what happens in the afterlife, then that's a data set. Then you have to prove why it is that I can take anybody off the street, have them do a hypnosis session, they say the same things about the afterlife. And what makes it even more unusual, and what we're going to talk about today, is they don't say what people say. They don't say the normal, the normal thing. They don't talk about religious aspects. They don't talk about the science aspects. They say something fundamentally contrary to what humanity has posited for the past, well, since civilization began. What happens after we die? We've all been told this is what happens after we die, or nothing happens after, right? Those are the two options. Something happens, and I know what it is, and nothing happens, and there's no point talking about it. Well, that's not in the data. I'm sorry. So like I said, I, my friend passed away, and then she started to come visit me. And I thought, OK, this is unusual. I have to figure out what this is. And I started uh, considering, if she still exists and come and comes and visit me, then doesn't it make sense that she is somewhere that I can go visit? So I started thinking about that. Like, well, where is she hanging out? bar in Schenectady? I mean, where do people go? And so I, while I was contemplating that, I had an out-of-body experience. And now I'd had them in my youth, you know, rip, you know, flying around the room kind of thing, waking up thinking, oh, that was a dream. Dismissed. But in this case, I found myself hurtling through deep space. I was in Manhattan at the time. I was thinking about it as I fell asleep. I suddenly took off and I went into, and all I can describe it is going into deep space. I could see stars going past me, but so fast that the light was melting. And then suddenly I took a sharp turn, only way I can describe it, in somewhere this way that put me through some kind of a wormhole, because I went around like that. And when I got on the other side, went through a black hole, let's just call it that. When I got on the other side, I was in another universe. How do I know that? Because instead of going this way, I was going that way. So everything was different. And at some point, I stopped, and there was my friend standing in front of me. And I, she wasn't speaking, but I heard her say, you were looking for me. This is where I am. And at that moment, some knucklehead honked this truck horn outside my window in Manhattan, you know, one of those massive semi-horns. But I was aware that before he took his hand off the horn, I made the trip back, like a rubber band, yanking my body, whoop, through the wormhole, back down, <laughs> seeing Manhattan come up at me like a zillion miles an hour, like in the movie Powers of Ten. And I sat up in my bed and I went, okay, all right, that's, that was unusual. What was that? And that sort of led me down this rabbit hole where I started studying what people said under deep hypnosis. And before I get to that, I just want to say the subject, today's subject is called, there's no I in team. In what? In team. T-A-L. T-E-A-L. There's no I in team. Why do I say that? I got this email the other day, and I want to read it to you. It's just a paragraph. This woman, I think her name is Frances Key. Thank you, Frances Key. I don't know you. But she wrote, in 2010, after my mother died, I had an incredible experience of communication with her. She described how we are all part of a team. And when we pass away, we return to our team and report back everything we learned, as if we were returning from a conference we've been set out to attend. Everyone on the team is able to absorb everything we learn without literally having to do it themselves. She also verified that we bring only an aspect of the soul to the earth to be with the body while the rest of our identity remains on the other side or even does other things in other dimensions. That's the architecture of the afterlife in a paragraph. Why? And how? Well, we'll talk about that. So here, so I started filming people under deep. I found the work of Michael Newton. Michael Newton was an author, psychologist from Los Angeles. Sorry, hypnotherapist from Los Angeles. 
who had 7,000 cases over 30 years where he had people under deep hypnosis talking <coughs> about the afterlife. And they described to him in sort of architectural terms how it worked. What made Newton so interesting was that he was a skeptic, he didn't believe in the afterlife, and then one day a patient spontaneously recalled being murdered in World War I, and because he didn't believe in the after a, a past life event, he grilled this poor guy, okay, where are you, what unit are you with, what's your, what's your sergeant's name, what's your mother's maiden name, That's those kind of things. And as Michael Newton put it in the documentary I made about the topic called Flipside, he said, I'm grilling this poor guy while he's being stabbed to death by a soldier. But Newton, again, because he was a skeptic, he sent all that detail off to the London Museum of War and discovered this guy really did exist, exactly as that he had said. So he opened up his practice to people who could recall previous lifetimes. And while he was doing that, sometime in the 1960s, a woman came in and she said, I'm very suicidal, I'm depressed. And in, during the course of their session, he said, well, take me to the source of your depression. And she said, oh, I'm in the life planning session with my friends. Picture all of us in a life planning session. And I'm realizing that we've agreed to be apart for this journey. And I know them all, and I'm going to see them all when I'm no longer here. Thank you, doctor. I'm done here. And Newton said, whoa, 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 wait a second. What is this? Is this a memory? Is this something that happened in the past? Is it something that happens in the future? And she said, no, I'm right now seeing them all in your office, my dear friends, who I've known for many lifetimes. As Newton put it, he said it was like a splash of cold water. He'd been a skeptic, and now here's somebody saying there's a between lives realm. And for the next 30 years, he did 7,000 clients who took him to that place, and he mapped the architecture of it. Remember I said, contrary to what science says and contrary to what religion says. What these people were reporting was that all religions point in the same direction. Let's just call it that. That all science points in the same direction. What's consciousness? How are things sentient? Etc. Etc. But that when we leave here, and this is what they said, roughly, because Newton would ask this question, how much of your conscious energy did you bring to this lifetime? And they would say, anywhere between 20 and 40%. And I noticed that this was consistent. In all the cases that I have filmed, eventually 50, over 50. People would say, they only bring about a third of their conscious energy to a lifetime. So that raises questions. If all of us are functioning, let's say we're functioning as humans, as, an, as the animal that we are, right? Sorry. We're functioning as that. But one third of our conscious energy, soul, if you want to call it that, probably one, conscious energy, animates us. And then we choose who we're going to be, where we're going to do what we're going to do, and then when our body ends, that energy goes home. Home. Home turns out to be the word that everybody calls the afterlife, underneath hypnosis. I was startled. The first time I heard it, I was like, home. Did this person mean Schenectady? Or did they mean the life, the home and the life they had just recalled? They had just recalled a life, terrible lifetime, and were they talking about Warsaw? No. They were talking about and even the word home, when I say it to all of you, which relates to near-death experiences, when I say it to everyone, you have an idea of what home is. We all do. What does home mean? We can argue about it. You take two twins, and they go, no, home means this, home means that. Home is, has to do with the heart. Home has to do with familiarity. It has to do with unconditional love. This is what people say. It has to do with a feeling of not being judged at all safety. If you look at near-death experiences consistently, I've interviewed a number of people who've had near-death experiences and, and either through hypnosis they've gone back to experience it, or I've learned you don't need hypnosis to go back and experience a near-death experience. You can actually go back into it like a packet of time. And what people say consistently data. 
is that they feel unconditionally loved during that event. Okay? So here we go again. Everybody's saying the same thing. People under deep hypnosis are saying they feel unconditionally loved. People having a near-death event afterwards, when I'm asking them questions about the near-death event, they're also describing that feeling of unconditional love. What does that mean? When I first heard it, I thought, well, that's an unusual term. I mean, it's not in the zeitgeist. It's not in commercials. It's not in books. It's not really talked about, even from the pulpit. People don't really talk about unconditional love. It's such an odd term. Do you know what I mean? I mean, we can, we can kind of all agree what that is. That means no judgment. Loving someone, well, look, we, we have it with pets. A lot of people. Some families, not all. Some people experience it in their lifetime, if they're fortunate. But my point is, that's the normal. What's abnormal is non-conditional love, or conditional love, I'm sorry, non-unconditional love. Conditional love, if you like me, I will like you. <laughs> That's conditional love. If you step on my foot, I slap you. Not conditional, not unconditional love. So. It's something that doesn't really exist on our planet. So let's just call it that. We talk about it, but it doesn't really exist here. However, it appears to exist home, back home, the place where we all go. So when this woman wrote about her mother's, now her mother didn't have a near-death experience. Her mother passed away, and her mother was communicating to her from the other side and reporting something new that this person had never heard before. So when you look at data that gives you new information, something that can't be cryptomnesia, you heard or saw or saw in a movie or read about, or heard Rich Martini talk about. If it's new information, then it's something to be looked at. And the mother is saying, I came from a team. I came here and I lived my life as part of a team. And when I went back home, I rejoined my team. And everybody understood my journey. And I understood everybody else's journey. But not a universal team. A team. Literally a team. Okay? And this is consistent with what people say under deep hypnosis about the journey. Now there's another scientist who brought this, this same information forward back in the 1970s. I stumbled across her work or it stumbled across me. You never know why these things happen. But Dr. Helen Wambaugh was a clinical psychologist from New Jersey back in the 1970s who was treating uh, Vietnam veterans for PTSD. And while she was doing that, she would have them go under hypnosis and go back to the event that happened, that occurred. And while they were doing that, sometimes they would go back to another event that occurred, just the same way Michael Newton had that experience. But as a scientist, she thought, well, how can I examine this information without making it personal? The personal version is you go see a hypnotherapist, they put you on the couch, they talk you through your life, they go back to a place, they say, let's go to a previous lifetime that has some significance to this life. And you do. You go back and you remember. But, you know, science would say, well, you're making a suggestion that you could have one as opposed to it just occurring. So in the way that she went around that is that she would have a group, a team. She would have a group session. People would be invited. She would poll people who were there who had had a near-death experience or had an out-of-body experience or had something spiritual that happened in their life or if they'd done hypnosis. Made that list. And then she would do an eight-hour session four times. Well, Two-hour sessions four times, eight hours. And each time she would give people an option. She would say, I want you to go back to a previous lifetime. I'm going to let you choose it. Let's say 200 years ago. Let's say 500 years ago. Let's say 2,000 years ago. And then after they spent two hours sort of examining, exploring what they're remembering, she would then poll them, which is what all science does. You know, Medicine, the reason we have drugs is because after you've 
tight, you've tried the drug, they do a list of so what were the effects, which we consider data. It's really eyewitness reports, and then you coalesce all that facts and figures. Well, she was doing the same thing, which is, what kind of clothing did you wear? What kind of food did you eat? What kind of utensils did you use? What was the construction material of the home you lived in? They sound like mundane things, but those are verifiable details. You know, if you lived in a mud hut, if you lived in a straw hut, if you lived in a building, what kind of clothes, what was the cotton, were people, what were they wearing back in that era? I was surprised to find that utensils were like the most important thing that you could have for the majority of people. So it was like people would talk about their spoon. It took me so long to make this spoon, and I had this unbelievable spoon, and I would polish it, you know, it hangs in it. I mean, we just don't think of it that way. She also had people talking about forks. You know, forks used to be like that, and then they became like that, and then they became like that. We don't think of these things, but two prong forks, three tines, four tines. Those are something that you can look up in the historical record. So you can actually verify what they're saying is accurate. So that's where she began. She got people to be accurately remembering previous lifetimes. And then she asked other questions. Tell me about why you came, why you're here. Tell me about, was there a choice involved? Was there, and it, all of these answers match up with what Michael Newton was doing. See? Oh, they all match up with what I've been doing, filming people under hypnosis. And people say the same things. This was back in 1978. She wrote Reliving Past Lives and Life Before Life, two books. They just, they're hard to find. But she was right on the money. And what people say, I'll start with just one detail. People in her 2,000 clinical cases said, we don't, we, those people, answer the question, we didn't show up before the fourth month. I'm sorry, the sixth month. In all the cases she did, no entity, no conscious being showed up in the fetus prior to six months. Detail. Data. Michael Newton, I happened to notice when my interview with him in Flipside, he said nobody showed up prior to the fourth month. In all the cases he did over 30 years, there's a two-month lap in there. But you see what they're both saying? We as conscious beings, that third of our conscious energy doesn't show up until the fourth month. Okay. That's the kind of data I'm talking about when I refer to the data of what people talk about the afterlife. And this kind of goes to what Ken asked me in his email which was, if, if what you're saying is true, or what these people are, I like to clarify that, it's not me saying this, this is what people are saying, and I'm reporting. I film them, and they say it. If it's true what these people are saying, that we choose our lifetimes, what was I thinking? <laughs> Why would any, and I had a Buddhist monk uh, ask me this, former Buddhist monk, why would I choose to be born as a HIV positive child in Africa in extreme poverty? You know, in the religious context, ah, sorry, in the religious context, oh, thank you God. In the religious context of Buddhism, if you're familiar with it, I am, I've been to Tibet and I've studied Tibetan philosophy with Robert Thurman, but in that context, your next lifetime is based upon your karma. Turns out that karma is a word, Sanskrit, in Sanskrit means action or energy. So the karma of your lifetime has to do with the energy of the life. Uh, you know, like you're going to overcome addiction. And you don't overcome addiction, bless you. Well, you do overcome it, whatever it is. And when you go back between lives, your counsel, your guides, they come and sit down with you and say, well, how did you do? And you go, I I conquered addiction. <laughs> and they go, ah, ah, ah. Uh, hold on a second. You also ate Cheetos like every day for, you really didn't <laughs> conquer what you were. And so they start to see that, oh, maybe I didn't. Maybe that's something I still need to work on. 
and they choose a lifetime where they're going to overcome that addiction. Now look, I simplified it. But let's go back to the, the Buddhist monk's concept, which was why would I choose such a difficult life? Well, let's break it down for you. How long is life? Is it 10 years? Is it 20 years? Is it 80 years? Look, we live in a world where our average lifespan is something like 70, I think? 85. Wow. So back in the time 2,000 years ago, it was 35. You know, you just think about that for a second. How much knowledge could you pass on? You were only 35 years old. You know, and then it's got to be written down like what you learn, and then you got to pass it on, pass it on. I mean, by the time you get here, we just don't have a lot of information to go on. And plus, of course, kids don't listen to us anyway. You know, it's not like you can say, and now here's what's going to happen next. And they go, get out. You know, I don't want to hear that. So that idea of, of what have we learned, what do we know? Well, the human body appears to not be able to access that information, except in extreme cases, in, except in consciousness altered cases. Near death event, out of body experience, LSD sometimes, hallucinogens, something else, deep hypnosis. So what's happening? How is it that deep hypnosis can mirror a near death event? Physiology, uh, physiologically. Is it possible for us to figure that one out? And I think that the answer is, Dr. Wamba talked about it, the left brain and the right brain. She was talking about how the left brain, you know, the left brain is considered, I mean, depending if you're right-handed or left-handed, but the left brain is considered the sort of hyper-vigilant rules and regulations, and the right brain is the ideation and creativity, et cetera, et cetera. But she was saying, the right brain functions more of a receiver of information and the left brain parses it. If you look at Dr. Grayson's YouTube talk, uh, Is Consciousness Produced by the Brain? It's a wonderful talk about this subject of consciousness. At the end of that talk, he talks about how it appears that the brain functions like a receiver, you know, like a stereo receiver. So sound waves go through the air. They're all around us. And the receiver picks them up and then it parses them into the right places. It filters them. It limits them so that we get the audio audible range. And that's how we hear music. Same with television, but stereo seems to work for me better. It turns out, as he points out in his talk, that people who have Alzheimer's in the UK, there was a study done, hospice care workers, 70% of them said that just prior to passing, people who had severe dementia suddenly reco recovered their memory. Either a few minutes, sometimes hours, sometimes days, even months prior to passing. Suddenly, everything was back in them. Oh, hey, there's my uncle. Hey, has my sister-in-law been here yet? We may have all experienced something like that with a loved one passing away, where they have this like super recovery. As, as uh, Dr. Grayson pointed out, it's as if the filters in the brain are dying. The stuff that's preventing us from accessing our memory, I point to it up here, because that's what the research shows. We can't access that memory and then the filters die. <laughs> the people in their post-mortem autopsies, their brains, demonstrate they were all atrophied to such a point that they should not have been able to remember anything. And yet they do. 70%. So that's, that's, a, that's a normal. What I'm saying is the filters allow us to glimpse the normal. <coughs> a friend of mine was in the hospital. Uh, she had cancer. And uh, a guy came in and sat down with her, held her hand, and they talked about jazz. And he was this orderly. And she was like, oh, he's this beautiful young man. And we just talked about jazz, and when he would come in, she'd go, oh, you know, Mr. Jazz is here. And then she would talk to him, and he really helped her. And then her family came to visit her. And she said, oh, I'm so glad you guys are here. I want you to meet Jazz. And they looked around the room and went, what are you talking about? She could see him. <laughs> they could not. That's what the brain is doing, filtering that information out. Of course, she was on drugs. 
you know, and of course they would tell you, well, she made that up, it's ideated, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm saying, since she's passed away, she's now hanging out with Mr. Jazz. So what I do is I took this research that I have been doing in terms of filming people talking about the afterlife, and then I thought, well, what's the next step in that? If what people are saying, having a near-death experience is true, that when they go home and they visit friends or they visit family or they visit their guides or counselors or whatever, if that's true, and then I compare that to what people under deep hypnosis are saying, where they claim while they're under hypnosis, Michael Newton would have them go back to a lifetime that they recalled and they'd go to the last day of that lifetime and then at the last day of the life, he'd say, well, now what happens? Where do you go? And they would say, I go home. And then he'd say, well, what's that? What happened? What's that like? What's the journey like? Some people would say, just like in a near-death event, I'm traveling, flying. Other people would say, I feel drawn, like magnets across a board. And then eventually they get back, and they usually are greeted, almost always greeted by someone. It's not always your guide, even though people will tell you that. Oh, your guide is there to greet you. Not always. I can tell you not always because I've heard many, many different answers. Sometimes it's your dog. Sometimes it's the pet that you had as a child. And what they're doing is giving you a soft landing, helping you, because your first reaction to seeing something you love unconditionally is to drop your disbelief. Oh, there you are. I've heard this consistently. And then I'll ask, so, who was the first person you saw? And a lot of times it's a relative, some one of those relatives who loved you unconditionally. Doesn't have to be ground, couldn't have to be blood related, could be Uncle Pete. I mean that is related, but it could be it could be anybody. Sometimes it's an angel. And when somebody says, I'm seeing an angel, I'm looking at an angel right here, that's wild. When they say I'm seeing an angel, I say Describe this angel to me. Is this somebody you know? Somebody you don't know? And they'll either say, I know them. Yeah I, yeah, I know them. I don't recognize them. I don't know who they are. But I feel like I know them. Or they'll go, oh yeah, that's actually my grandmother. and She's wearing wings. That's weird. And then I'll ask, go, oh, let's go examine the wings. Can you hold the wing in your hand? You see, I ask questions because you can ask questions. People don't think you can, but you know, like if we were sitting here and I said, and here's an angel, you would have this, and if you saw the angel, you'd be like, ah, oh, <laughs> there's an angel here. And I'm like, well, no, 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 don't focus on that part of it. Focus on who are you? Let me hold your hand. What does that feel like? What does your, your wing feel like? And then what I do is I compare the answers. <coughs> One person says, you know, it feels like feathers. And another person says, it feels like uh, some kind of a weird uh, cotton material that's been stitched. Another person says, it's light. And then I ask the angel, what, why? Why, why wings? Why not a tail? You know, why not wheels? And they'll say, Rich, <laughs> stop asking stupid questions. No, they'll say, Rich, it's a metaphor for travel. travel. Really, travel. Why? Because we travel at the speed of thought. We can be everywhere with everyone simultaneously. Now I get answers like that all the time, and I, you know, I, I try not to judge the answer. Now, let me write that down. I'm filming it. I'll transcribe that later. But it's not just one person, it's the consistency. You know, like all I could say is, so how did I get to a point where I can interview people on the flip side? And that's, that's where this kind of work that I've been doing sort of took a, an unusual step. About four or five years ago, um, a medium reached out to me, Jennifer Schaefer. She's in Manhattan Beach. She actually spoke in the Gloom of Woods last week. Where did you go? Where? Yeah. And uh, she works with law enforcement. That's her gig. She helps you know people with murder cases or missing person cases, and you know that's like a it's like one of those occupations you don't want to be part of. But if you have a gift, you know people need you. She reached out to me about four years ago and said, 
you know, I'm fascinated by your work, it's interesting, and I, like any other normal person, thought, oh, psychics, like, you know, why aren't you rich from the lottery? You know, whatever, I just, I didn't understand it. And then, so I said, well, what is it you do? And then she told me about missing person cases, and I said, oh, listen, I, um, I've spent 30 years looking for a missing person. Do you want to help me find her? She was like, I'm in. Took my camera, set it up. For three hours, I interviewed Amelia Earhart. I've worked on every movie that's been made about her. Fox, uh, Turner. I've done 30 years of research. I know what happened to Amelia Earhart. What happened? Not that it matters. It's in my book, Hacking the Afterlife. We're not going to talk about Amelia today. But if you go online and search my name or Earhart on Saipan, you'll find out. Video. But but Amelia, in a nutshell, I knew her story after 30 years of, of really intense forensic research, and I got paid by studios to do it. So I got paid a lot of money, and I was able to really dig up every possible thing. Why isn't it common knowledge what happened to her? I don't know. I can't answer that question. All I know is for me, I was able to figure out what happened to her. A, B, C, D, F, G. So now I'm with the media, and I'm testing her. And I turn my camera on and I say, I, I want to talk to blah, blah, blah. I don't say her name, I just say I want to talk about this person. And next, you know, two seconds she's saying, oh, it's a pilot and her name is Amelia, it's an Amelia Earhart. And the next thing you know, three hours go by, everything that I know about her is confirmed. One thing after the other. My brain, my skeptical Hollywood lizard brain is going, did Jennifer Schaefer look me up? <laughs> Did she do this research somehow? Did she read these books that only I've read? I mean, how could she possibly know these answers? And then Amelia gave me something new, new information, something I did not know, something Jennifer couldn't know, but something that Amelia knew. Because I said to her, so how did you die? And she said, and just so you know, she was arrested by the Japanese, taken to Saipan, and spent the rest of her days in prison there. Her plane was found by U.S. soldiers, 1944. It's all, I've had eyewitness interviews, it's online. But I said, so how did you die? Because I heard two different reports. I had heard one that she was executed for being a spy, beheaded, and the other one that she was shot. And she, Jennifer, said neither. She's showing me it was dysentery. Oh, okay, and I had heard that as well. I said, are you sure it was dysentery? You're not just like telling me that to, to keep me from being upset or something? And she said, no, when the two GIs who, when the two GIs dug me up, they only found my arm. That sentence, Jennifer could not know. I knew in 1963, a guy named Fred Gerner had written a book uh, and talked and interviewed these two GIs who had dug her up, who said they dug her up, they were told to go out and dig up her body. And that is inside, inside stuff that you gotta find, you gotta really search for. I knew that that existed. But here she was saying, they didn't find my body, they only found my arm. And I wrapped up my camera, started driving away thinking, is it possible that I was talking to Amelia Earhart? And the phone rang, and it was an NTSB investigator from Seattle calling me up, and he was saying, Rich, you're not going to, 10 minutes later, he said, Rich, you're not going to believe this. I just spent five hours looking through Amelia Earhart's case, point by point by point. Everything you told me is in there. This is a, a, an investigator who used to be a federal agent who had dug through, and he spent 30 years working on it. But everything that you told me is in there. He said, except when they dug up her body, they only found her arm. <laughs> I had to pull the car over. <laughs> and then six months later, doing the kind of forensic research I can do, I found that indeed these guys said in an interview with UPI, Chicago uh, Tribune, 1977, when we dug her up, we only found a partial rib cage and her arm. The point isn't about Amelia, bless her heart. Bless her air heart. It's about new information from the flip side. And when I heard that and when I confirmed that, I realized ah, a medium is a cell phone. You can access people on the other side using a medium that you trust or know or can verify their work. 
how cool is that? And so Jennifer and I, for the past four years, every Thursday for two hours, I film my cell phone talking to the other side. Got a couple of books of those kinds of backstage pass to the flip side. Um, and I'll tell you, the reason it's called Backstage Pass to the Flip Side is a funny, uh, funny title, is that when I met Jennifer and, and uh, well, I'll go back a little bit. I think about the third or fourth time we met, uh, you know, and I'm still thinking, is it, this is insane or crazy or whatever. This is abnormal. And I was in a restaurant with her and she said, Michael Newton is here. No, she said, Morton is here. I'm sorry, killed my own joke. She said, Morton is here. And I said, Excuse me? She said, the guy, you know, the guy you made a movie about. I don't know anybody named Morton who's dead. She went, the, the guy, the flip side. I went, oh, Michael Newton. He's here? Now, if Jennifer was trying to convince me of something, you know, you'd think she'd get the guy's name right. I said, what does he want to say? She said, uh, he wants to tell you that he's working with people on how to communicate with the afterlife. I said, all right, let me clarify this. Michael was very much about clarification. You're saying that Michael is telling us that he's act helping people over here to talk to people over there. Is that correct? And she said, he says, no, the opposite. He's helping people over there to make cute communicative people over here. Didn't know it was hard, did you? But in that moment, I realized what he was saying. It's hard. Somebody passes away. They're over there, they come to their loved one, they try to talk to them, they can't hear them, they don't believe it, it's a ghost, the lights go on and off, ah, I'm scared, you know, oh, I felt my, uh, my Uncle Pete was here, ah. <laughs> and they dismiss it, like we do. It's hard for them to communicate. What he's saying is he's helping them. <clears throat> and so I was about to go on Coast to Coast that weekend, and I said, well, give me a one, two, three. What's something I can tell people to help them communicate? He said, uh, say their name. What? I said, do you say it aloud or in your head? He said, doesn't matter. He, he said, doesn't matter, Richard. I thought that was interesting. Then number two, he said, ask your questions. And I said, well, how do people know the difference between asking a question that's real, right? That they, like the answer they want to hear and, and mm -hmm. making a connection. He said, when they answer the question before you can form the question, you'll know. Got that? When you hear the answer before you can ask the question, that means you've made a connection with your loved one. Now, I can tell you, I, I speak a lot on Quora. Um, <laughs> yesterday I got a message from them that I've had six million views of my answers, because you know, people send me a question and I write about blah blah blah, you know, whatever. I get a lot of people in India sending me questions. But anyway, um, I lost that thought, Mary. So what was I saying? When you hear the answer before you form the question. Oh, thank you. Yes. Other Mary. <laughs> Mary too. So I, I got an email from a guy I've never met before. He's a scientist. He lives in England and he says, you know, Rich, I got to tell you, you were saying this stuff about the flip side and it, you know, it's not in my scientific mind. However, I tried your method. He said, my mom passed away and I imagined sitting with her for 10 minutes. I just pictured her in front of me as if I was holding her hands. And, you know, I was like debating, like I'm not hearing anything, but I, all right, I'll, I'll try, I'll ask a question. Mom, who was there to greet you when you crossed over? And he heard Hugh Nestle. <laughs> and he went, like, what? You know, is that who greets people on the other side? Is that Dr. Death? Yeah. But he wrote it down, Hugh Nestle. And then he was thinking about it, like, who's Hugh Nestle? So he writes his sister, who he's called the keeper of all family things, and she wrote back and said, that's your, that's your great-grandfather, you nut. That was her grandfather, Hugh Nestle. Something he didn't know. New information. So that's proof of concept. 
I've had many people write to me and say, I, I, you know, I, I, you're not going to believe it, but you know, I was in my mind's eye holding my, I started asking questions and they answered before I could even ask the question, how is that possible? Because once we're not here in the physical realm that we're in, we're outside of time. Time exists on the flip side. I know you'll hear a lot of people say time doesn't exist. Everything's happening simultaneously. You've heard that? That's not in my research. I reported if it was, but what they say is each lifetime is linear. Otherwise, you wouldn't learn anything. One guy put it this way. Think of a string. And on that string are all your lifetimes, left to right. Life, 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 life. That's linear. Oh, I learned how to, you know, this one, oh, I learned that. Oh, this one, I learned this, this one, I learned that. But when you turn the string, so you can look down the barrel of the string, they all seem simultaneous. You can see how that one lifetime that you had back in the Renaissance, where you died of dysentery, has led directly to become a doctor in this lifetime, where you cured the illness. Because you understand it. I've heard people say, on the flip side, I chose, yeah, I chose that lifetime so I could suffer, so I could learn what that suffering is, so I could teach others not to suffer. Going back to that Tibetan Buddhist question, why would I choose a lifetime? Born in Africa, HIV positive, in abject power. The way I put it is this, I come to you and I say, Okay, I got something. I need your help. I need you to come with me. Here's the thing. You know that six years on Earth feels like six minutes here. I had one person who did a session. She did a 25, she had a 25 year lifetime here. When she got back home, she said, it felt like I was gone for 10 minutes. I've heard this consistently. 10 minutes, 25 years, 10 minutes. 2,500 years, 1,000 minutes. So if you run into somebody who lived 2,500 years ago, not so weird to run into somebody who you knew a month ago. But again, back to the six minute thing. Six, I'm gonna ask you to come to life for six years. You're gonna be born sick. You're gonna live with a lot of flies. <laughs> Pretty much it's gonna be all flies all the time. However you're gonna teach profound lessons in love. Your mother, your father, the doctors and nurses who take care of you are going to learn about unconditional love. Can you do that for me? Can you give me six minutes? Now, I'm the kind of guy who would say, no thanks, no, no. I don't like flies. You know, let, somebody, let Larry do it. Larry's great with flies. He doesn't mind the flies. But that comes back to the team concept, you see? We think we come here solo. We think we're here solo. We think we experience life solo. We think we suffer solo. We think we are just by ourselves going through this deluge. It's not in the data. You have a team. Each one of you has a team. Now, I'm sure you're curious. Who's in my team? Yeah. Right? So, a simple way to figure out is in your team. Well, there's a few ways. Deep hypnosis, very simple way. Scott DeTambles in Claremont, he does Skype sessions. He's a virtuoso. Worked with him many times. He was here tonight. Scott, he spoke here. And Scott's really good at what he does. And within a, within a few minutes, you can be talking to your team. So, and Michael Newton put it this way, some people you're surprised, like who's in my team? Uncle Pete, I hate you. I never liked you or you harassed me my whole, you asked me to do that. You don't remember? Did you look at the contract? <laughs> <laughs> you asked me to play crazy Uncle Pete. I did it for you as a favor. There was a woman I filmed under deep hypnosis who recalled dying in the 1800s and she was pushed off a ship. And in the session, it's in the movie Flipside, in the session she's there saying, oh my God, they killed me, they pushed me off the ship. I, you know, I'm swearing like a sailor. And then, and then as the hypnotherapist, I think it was Pete Smith who did the session, 
she got in up into the between lives realm and said, oh, I see, I was a terrible person. I, the ship had run aground and I was stealing food from all my comrades and they voted me off. Mm -hmm. And the captain pushed me over. And then she said, and now the captain is coming forward and he's holding my hands and he's saying, you have no idea how hard it was to do that to you in this lifetime. And she suddenly realized it was the agreement that she had asked for, so she had experienced being negative. This is the performance stage. We're all here with our props, we've got our costumes. Right? Part of us is in the audience. Maybe far away, <laughs> maybe too far for your own taste. But part of our conscious energy is in the audience, in the rafters, up there, watching us, our consciousness. And as this woman said in the email, your consciousness could be doing other things. If only 30% of us is here, as I once asked a guide, could, is it possible that my conscious or somebody's conscious energy could be also somewhere else doing something else? And they said, do the math. Okay. So part of us is here. Part of us is home, watching us here. When we look around the room, we see costumes, we see props. We think we're so low. We think we're low. So how do we know who's not in our troop, our acting troop? I, I've been calling it a classroom because when people call it like my soul group, it kind of, you know, like I say, you see Uncle Pete and you're not connected to him, you feel like, I don't want to be part of this group. You know, and why aren't my parents part of my soul group? That doesn't make any sense to me. And Michael Newton would say, there's affiliate groups. Well, they're acting troops all over. Everywhere is acting, everybody. And when you run into somebody, you might, you might work with somebody in another play. You might do Shakespeare with somebody else. And then you come back to your group. Your group generally is learning a lesson. They might be learning a lesson in addiction. That one group I interviewed was talking about that. Everybody in the group was doing addiction. One of them had overdosed. One of them was overweight. You know, let them, addiction. The whole idea of learning how to overcome the energy of addiction. But that actor's troop, if you don't do deep hypnosis and you just want to figure out who's there, all you got to do is look around, go through your life. Who have I met that I feel like I've known forever? Just start there. Very simple. And the, what I do with people is I say, well, tell me about your significant other. The person you're married to or the person you had the profound relationship with. What about them made you think that that was the right person to be with? And people will always tell you, well, this is how we met. We were working at the same place. Sorry, sorry. Uh, you know, we were working at the same office and we just happened to run into each other, blah, 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 that's the story. I say, no, 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 tell me the moment where you looked into the eyes of the person that you were with and you said, this is it, this is the person. And they, sometimes it takes a while. But like my sister-in-law, that's my wife texting me from, she's with my sister-in-law right now said, uh, oh, I still don't know if he's the right guy. You know, they have five kids together. I said, no, come on, go, go back into the moment when you knew. And she said, okay, it was the second date. Something in the sound of his voice and the look in his eyes made me feel like I was home. And I said, what does home mean? She said, unconditionally loved. Second date. And I said, well, let me ask him. And she said, don't ask him. He doesn't bark. He doesn't know. I went, well, let's ask. I looked at him. I said, so when did you know? And he said, the day I met her. I was in a classroom, and I looked across the class, and I went, oh, there's my wife. Now, I've heard that sentence a dozen times. There's my husband. Somebody who was 11 years old, a girl got pushed into a puddle, and she stood up and got out of this guy, came and helped her out of the puddle, and she turned to her friend and went, I'm going to marry that guy. And when she did marry him, she didn't know until they went to the story and they realized. You, if you look it up online, you'll find people who met at Disneyland when they were four and had a connection. 
and then didn't find each other again. We tend to think of ourselves as solo. We tend to not think of ourselves as a team. But everybody's working on everything, not only here, but over there. Get in the car. You want to go to this concert tonight. It's really important you go to the concert. I don't want to go to the concert. Go to the concert. <laughs> I'm not really sure why I'm here. Oh, who are you? I'm sorry. I feel like, I feel like we know each other. Have we met somewhere? We've all had that experience. I was walking in London, and a guy introduced me to somebody, and I shook this Oxford professor's hand, and I heard a voice in my ear say, this is why you're in London. And I'm like, okay, that's weird. You know, this kind of Oxford dude, professor guy. But I, you know, I paid attention. Who are you? Blah, 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 what's your email? Let's, you know, let's, you know, we start, so we start writing to each other. And then he writes me this terrible story about his daughter dying suddenly and how he was so bereft about it, but he said, Rich, it's as if my whole life I had been dreading that day. When I drove to pick up her body, the whole way I felt, oh my God, my whole life I've been dreading this day. Which, that led me into Carol Bowman's book, Children's Past Lives, and I sent it to him. You know, I think, you know, maybe take a look at this. And he wrote me back, he said, are you familiar with the work of Michael Newton? I was not. So I started this documentary about Michael Newton. And then after I had interviewed Michael Newton, I wrote to my friend and I said, you're not gonna believe it. You know, everything that you've said to Michael Newton, oh my God, ah! And then he said, well, I've scheduled a session with a Michael Newton trained hypnotherapist here in London. I said, that's great. So he wrote me afterwards, he said, told me this whole story, he saw his daughter, she went over all the lifetimes that they had together. He said, that was very profound. He said, you know, I, people don't believe you when you say, I was holding my daughter's hand, but you know what it feels like to hold your daughter's hand. Nobody else does, but you do. And he said, and I saw a lifetime in Boston in 1840, where I was a banker, and I was married to this girl, and she died, and then I became an alcoholic, and I died. He said, however, the interesting part is the girl, I know her from this life. She was a girl I met in Asia, and we went out briefly. <laughs> but in the other lifetime, he, she was the love of his life. So I said, are you, from, are you still friends with her? And he said, yeah. I said, well, let's try an experiment. Why don't I arrange for her to have a past life regression? I found a hypnotherapist in Boston who didn't know anything about what this guy had said or experienced, nothing, zero, zero. She knew nothing about what he said, nothing, zero, zero. She had the same past life memory, 1840, married to this guy in Boston. So it's, a, it's that's you know proof of concept, but it's an evidentiary point that it can't be that they're pulling these lifetimes out of some unconscious pool. So this is what the architecture of the afterlife is about. A, there's no I in team. B, we choose our lifetimes. We have a group of friends who argue with us, wrestle with us, talk to us. What are you gonna play? What are you gonna do? I'm gonna do this, let's meet up. I'll tell you what, I'll meet you at Starbucks, okay? That'll be great. You'll be addicted to coffee and then you'll meet me there where I met my <laughs> wife. However that goes, everybody has their own individual plot points. And then we come here to Earth. We come here, we incarnate here, and we, according to these re reports, not my opinion, we have many choices, other places. This ain't the only game in town. But we come here because it's fun here, because we get the tactile sensations. As one person said, you can learn more in one day from tragedy on Earth spiritually than you can for 5,000 years on some boring planet. How about that? This is the show, Earth. This is where it's happening. You know, baseball, they call it the show. This is the show. This is where it happens. It takes courage to come here. Any one of us could have opted out. Do you want to play the guy with the six flies? No! That was another profound thing in this research. We can say no, which is contrary to what everyone's ever told us about reincarnation. We can say 
pass. Our guides will say to us, you know, you can pass now, but eventually you're going to have to learn this lesson. And you can say, okay, <laughs> eventually I will. You guys go and have fun. I will watch you from the cheap seats and I will encourage you. I'll do anything I can to help you. I just need a break. I really just want to chill. Let this one pass. Okay, Rich. So that's what I've been doing is talking to people on the flip side. So somewhere along the line, how what time we got? How are we doing? What? Oh, there I am. I have another five minutes? Okay, so what I, I'm sorry, so so like I said, I meet with Jennifer every week and I started realizing that the people on the flip side, it's like a cell phone. And, and But you got to get them, you got to give them help to contact you. And so they can't talk because you have to make sound move, generally. Some people hear, most people don't. But they can make images. And how do they create an image? They tap that weird engram on your brain that has the URL to wherever that off-site memory is of certain things. So when I'm interviewing Jennifer, she'll say, Elvis is here. And I'll laugh and go, why? And then she'll say, oh, oh, no, there's somebody that he was in a movie with that wants to talk to you. And I'll know what he's talking about. I did this with my friend Bill Paxton, the actor. Billy passed away a couple years ago. And I just happened to be interviewing a medium that day. And I thought, well, let's just see if I can talk to him. So I asked him my usual 20 questions. Who was there to greet you when you crossed over? What happened? Tell us about your journey, blah, blah, blah. And then I did it with two other mediums. One medium, I didn't, wasn't there when I, I just supplied the questions. Somebody else did the questions. In all three sessions, and since then, my friend Bill, not the movie star Bill, but my friend Bill came through, talked about how we met in a pub in London, what we're, you know, our journey together why his career took off and mine did not. <laughs> Whatever. So I can be here today. Um, but talking to Bill Paxson is on Gaia right now. So if you want to sign up for Gaia, I think you can, whatever, you can sign up for free for a month or something like that. It's, uh, it's me interviewing a medium, two, three different mediums, and talking to somebody who I knew who was on the planet, using mediumship as a cell phone. Okay. Why is that important, Janet? You know the answer to this. Why is that important? Because if it's true what these people are saying, that we choose our lifetimes, then doesn't it make sense to leave behind fresh water, fresh air, fresh earth? <laughs> if not for our children's sake, but for our own possible return. <laughs> Wouldn't that make sense? I mean, if you're gonna come back here, wouldn't it be great to be able to take up a glass of water and drink it and not think, ah, what was that? What is that? Burp. Or food or whatever. So that's why I do this work. That's why I, I allow myself to be under ridicule from all my Hollywood friends. What are you doing? Are you still talking about that stuff? <laughs> um, but I also must say, it, Luana, my friend Luana, is key to this, this journey. She continues to be our conduit, so I was gonna tell you about the Backstage Pass, the reason the book is called Backstage Pass, the flip side, is because one day Jennifer and I were in our usual place where we do these sessions, and she said, Tom Petty is here. And I said, why? And he had just passed away the week before. And she said, well, um, he said he's been waiting all week to talk to us. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know Tom. I didn't know Tom. So, well, Tom knew Paxton, so, He's here because of that, so, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Luana knows him. I'm like, okay. So, and then Tom, so what do you want to say, Tom? He said, you know, getting to talk to you is like, is like going backstage. It's like your friend Luana here has a, has, a, has a clipboard, and it's all the people who get to talk. And it's like she's got the backstage pass. And I went, okay. Well, that's a good title for a book. So Luana, my friend Luana, who passed away in 1996, Every week we converse with her. She brings a room together of people. She helps them communicate. She helps them take what they want to express. She shows them how to dumb it down so that Jennifer can hear it or see it and then say it to me. And then I unpack what they're trying to tell us. 
so that then I can now ask a follow-up question. So what does this mean? So what happened with this? Blah, 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 blah. Some people have complained because there's a lot of celebrities, right, that show up. I think that's, A, because Luana was in over 300 movies, 300 TV shows and 30 movies, and so she knew everybody. They all respected her as an actor. But everybody that's in our class that has shown up in our class on the flip side, they know other people. And then they, the word gets out. You want to pass along a message to your children? Talk to Martini. <laughs> And I kid you not, I've had experiences in my apartment where I'm, you know, cooking something and I hear a voice, okay, over here, I hear a voice say, I understand you're the guy I need to talk to to pass along a message to my daughter. <laughs> and I go, who, who the heck is this? <laughs> but I know who it is because the image of them just popping in my head. I'm not a medium, but, I, but I'm, I'm a guy who knows mediums. And so I say, okay, listen, dude. I appreciate you showing up in my apartment, but I can't talk to you. Get in line. Go see Luana. Get your pass. And then, I kid you not, I drive to Jennifer's office or, or this place where we meet, and then I say, somebody reached out to me uh, this week. And she'll look at me and go, John McCain. And I'll say, yes, how do you know that? She says, he's here. And I say, Senator McCain. What do you want to talk to us for? And the, but I asked the same questions. Who was there to greet you when you crossed over? Have you talked to some of the people that you killed while you were during the Vietnam War? Have you met those guys? Have you met the prisoners of war? Who is it you're hanging out with? Was it you know, your journey? You went through a lot of pain and suffering. Yes, and I got a lot of medals for it, Rich. He talks about those things. And then I say, well, what is it you want us to pass along to your child? Megan, this is what he wanted to talk to. He said, I wanted to run for governor. I said, John, I don't know your daughter. I'm not going to reach out to her. He said, yes, you are. <laughs> and he said, uh, you tell her that there was a teddy bear that I gave her and such and such campaign, and it looks like this, and she'll know that's me. And you're going to tell her that I'm telling her she needs, she should run for governor. <sighs> and so, I don't know her. But I was on Coast to Coast about a month ago, and talking to George Nuri and I tell him this story and he goes, well, I know her. Send along whatever it is you want to say. So I did. If Megan decides to run for governor, then we'll know where she heard it. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's it for the day. I don't know if I can tell you any more. I can tell you more, but uh, that's as much time as they gave me. So let's go to your questions. I know you're just eager, eager, eager. Take a deep breath. Our guides on the flip side. So please have a seat. Yes. Oh, seat. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Grab your All right. Quiet. First, I'm going to look at my camera. Make sure that we're okay. still, still filming. And oh, we got these. I mean, we're never going to hear this. I'm like a mile away. All right. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Which chair? Doesn't matter. Choose. I'll choose. What do you guys think? Left or right? You choose. That's right. I'm. I'm with a bunch of mediums. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm kidding. Who would like to be the first person? Ken? Just don't be shy. Just come on up. I won't torture you. Okay. If you have a Unless question, you, want me to. you need to come up and just have a seat. Please, only one question per person. Okay. Ken's up. Come on. The Marys. <laughs> Do the Marys have a question? I can. I did you like my answer? Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, very good. Ken sent me an email. It said, uh, I want you to answer this question. So, I have another question. Sure. I have a lot of them. But now that I want to have them. Uh, you know, I hate to sound like an answer guy, but I, what else am I going to do? What if you wanted to experience a life like a Bill Gates or instance? Yeah, big bucks. <laughs> well, let's, you know, there's a couple of ways to figure out the answer to that. One is to ask Bill Gates' his higher self, you know, why, why did you choose this lifetime? Uh -huh. Another way to do it is to examine, you think about all your lifetimes, and, and then you really have to examine what a lifetime is. Now, those familiar with my book, Flipside, know there's a chapter called Volum Populatum, and it's somebody spoke to me when I was asleep and I heard of, in Latin, 
I don't speak Latin, but I woke up and I, but six weeks later I looked it up. It means annihilate vanity. And I was thinking to myself, oh, who would ever tell me to annihilate? I live in LA, where do I begin? <laughs> but it turns out that what, that this part of this research or part of what I'm doing is annihilating the concept of props on stage that mean vanity. So you and I choose to play our roles, we get on stage, and you say, well, I want the big car. And I go, good luck with that. Good luck with that big car. If you look at Bill's journey, Bill's not aware of anything that we're talking about. Zero. If you look at Bill, Bill's brain, you know, the movie, documentary, has no clue of what we're talking about. So all of that money, all of that stuff, has not opened the door an inch. His friend, his co-founder, yeah. all right, let me tell you this story. So his co-founder, Paul Allen, oh, yeah. so you know he passed away. As an experiment, I thought, why not? I don't know Paul Allen, let's just see. So I went to Jennifer's uh, office, and I asked for three people that I had spoken with to come and help. I sat down with her and she said, A, B, and C. She named all three people right in a row that I had asked in a row to come and help us. And I said, they want, I'm, so I'm asking these guys, would you help Paul Allen come and help? His initial reaction, Paul Allen, she goes, he's here. He feels reluctant to speak with you because he doesn't know what it is you're doing. He's trying to figure out what it is. I said, okay, well, let's talk to him a little bit, blah, blah, blah. Who was there to greet you when you crossed over? I think it was a dog. I said, well, so tell me about your journey. Tell me why you chose this journey. She goes, he's showing me um, uh, a football football player and a basketball player. I said, well, that would make sense. He owned, he owned two teams. So that's the Oxford. Said, oh, I saw. And I said, well, who was there to greet you when you crossed over? Jennifer says, he's showing me these two football players. And I'm like, really? Uh, describe them. She described Dave Dewerson from the Chicago Bears and Junior Sale from the San Diego Chargers. Both football players who committed suicide because of CTE. I knew that, Jennifer did not. But she described these guys. And I said, well, what are you, what are you guys doing here? We came to thank him for his Brain Institute. He's helping people with CTE. And since then, I did a session with Junior's widow, Gina Sayo. She came up, I did not tell Jennifer who she was, but we spoke to Junior Sayo for two hours. He talked about his mind deteriorating. But in all three sessions I've done where I've spoken to people on the flip side, they all came forward to say to us, you need to reach out to Joe Namath. And the reason is because Joe Namath has cured CTE using hyperbaric oxygen therapy. He was just on TV talking about it. Jennifer didn't know who he was. She kept saying, Joe Montana. <laughs> but she, or she would say, Fran Tarkington. And I would say, well, wait a minute, that, that's me unpacking. I'd say, you're asking about a quarterback who's named Joe. Is that correct? Yes. I eventually figured it out. So Paul Allen chose his lifetime. I think we asked him about previous lifetimes. Usually people have had very difficult lifetimes before. They've chosen a lifetime to see what it's like on the opposite end. Really? So yeah. So if you're if you want to play the Bill Gates part, your guys will say, first you got to play the guy you know living in poverty and some other place. Come on, so I've already done that. Well, if you've already done, well, your guys <laughs> know. Okay, whatever. Your guides know. Your guides know, and you can ask them. You know, but here's my other point, which is really the the vanity part. You know, bless Bill Gates is hard, but he gets up every day and, you know, he's got to get on the cell phone to talk to somebody on the other side of his house. Yeah. You can't go, honey, could you get me some coffee? It's got to be like, uh, Larry, you know, call the guy with... Money doesn't make your life... I know people don't believe this, but money doesn't make your life better. It makes, it makes stuff <coughs> different, but not better. Well, if, you live in, if you live with people who love you unconditionally, yeah. that's the meaning of life. That's why you're here. If you're somebody who's surrounded by people who love you unconditionally, Mother Teresa, fill in the blank, those are the people who scored. Right. They, they get the applause when they go home. Wow. 
There was one guy, one last thing, there was one guy in Michael Newton's work, a guy in between lives, he's talking to his counsel, and they say, how do you think he did? He said, oh, I did great. I donated all this money to charity. And they said, no, no, who did you help? He said, no, no, I gave away all my money. And they said, uh, no, we're asking who you helped. And he said, I, I can't think of a single person. And they said, no, you did. And they showed him once during the Depression he was on a bus and a woman was sobbing and he put his arm around her and said, it's going to be okay. That was the key moment in his lifetime. So keep going. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> yeah, that's why they pay me to be bucks. Mary! I got one Mary. Come on, Mary. How are you? How are you, Mary? I just want to um, ask you to say again something you told us last week yes you were Jennifer was there and we were, we were talking about Jennifer's father Jim Jim and you had asked Jim about grief about grief very good and I will repeat the story very quickly my friend Jennifer her father had passed away and it, she really didn't tell me about it but she was struggling because she couldn't work because of her grief. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know the stages of grief and all that stuff about grief, 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 grief. Okay. I, I've had I haven't had that kind of experience in my life, but I know a lot of people have. So while one day she said, I my father's here, and then burst into tears. And I took the opportunity to try to focus her to her father to say, Can I ask your father some personal questions? And she couldn't say anything but yes. And I said, so Jim, how do we help people with grief? She said, he says, move grief to nostalgia. And I said, what does that mean? She said, I have no idea. Tears, tears. And I said, well, let's ask him. He's here. <laughs> and she said, oh, oh, he's saying that the grief is just all sad. All the memories, all the energy is sadness. Nostalgia contains both sad and happy memories. When you can move grief to nostalgia, you can begin the healing process. Thank you, Mary. Thanks to Jim. That was not from me, and that was not from Jennifer. Janet, do you have a question? Oh, sorry. Come on. Oksana. Yes. What's your question? Have one. Hello. Hello. Nice Rich. To meet you. Uh, about four years ago, my daughter and her wife adopted twins. Uh, went to Tennessee and brought them home. We had been trying for several years to, to start a family. Within several months, they began to have paranormal activity in their home, almost always in the twins' room, knocking on walls. Uh, stuff. Stuff. Furniture, literally. Yeah. 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 And so uh, they had a, went through several people that finally found someone that specialized in cleansing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and he's gone now. He seemed to be a male presence. Well, do you have any sense of what, what was totally, going on? Totally. Totally. I appreciate the question. Tell me your name again. Yeah. What was the question? The question is uh, she said that her, her daughter adopted, they adopted twins. Interesting thing about twins. And that they, when the twins arrived, there was like paranormal activity, you know, weird stuff mm -hmm. moving, and and I guess probably knocking negative on knocking on walls and a feeling of negativity. Uh, yeah, the, the twins actually it lasted so long that they began when they were uh, began to talk, they would scream in the middle of the night, "Get out of here! Get out of here!" Okay, very good. <laughs> All right, so very good. So. Uh, you know, that's a, a number of things. First thing I want to say is twins have this unusual quantum entanglement uh, experience in life. You know, you've heard that term quantum entanglement. That's when two, two things are created at the same time and, and no matter where the other one is, it reacts. When this one is tickled, that one reacts. Twins have that experience. So one breaks a leg, the other one feels it simultaneously. Not like, like faster than light. So it's an unusual thing. I've talked to twins about this. So that's a kind of a gift. Um, and when somebody shows up, and now listen, I you know, I know that there's a lot of shows on TV, and they talk about paranormal activity, and they frighten you. But 
in my experience, like I was saying at the beginning, ghosts are people who used to be here. So if you start with the premise, the ghost was here first, whoever the ghost is. So you have to start there. So we're intruding on the ghost persona or, or their reality. So, you know, is was the ghost in with the twins? Maybe. Was the ghost with the house? Likely. Why would suddenly that star activity start happening? Because Mr. Ghosty, person who's, who's still here, is somehow reacting to their, their presence. Whatever, whatever it is. Angry, <coughs> upset. But I, I'll, so I'll give you an example. Because I've done this so much, I'm familiar with the architecture. I was at uh, Beyond Belief, which is George Murray's television show on Gaia. And I was, this was last, uh, my last appearance. I was in the makeup room. The makeup artist was doing my makeup, and the producer ran in and said, oh, tell him about the ghost. And I said, what? She said, well, we saw a ghost. She said, There's, somebody's been breaking all the lamps in our locked lamp room. So like we go in there and the lamps are all broken. And people have heard it, but I saw him. And I said, okay, um, do you want to explore that? And she said, sure. And so I said, well, try to picture that ghost. What did it look like? Was he young or old? Just in that flash. She said, oh, he seemed about 20 years old, and this is how he's dressed, and et cetera, et cetera. And I said, all right, well, just take a freeze frame of that person. Let's ask him some questions. Try to get closer to him. Let's, let's see if he answers. So I asked him, who are you? He had a name, Bob. He, he claimed, through her, that he had died in a fire, that he lived in a town nearby, gave us all these details. And I said, so what are you doing smashing lights, dude? What's your problem? And he said, I hate the people who come on this show and talk about the afterlife. They're all liars. It's the makeup artist telling me this. <laughs> So I thought that's hilarious, because I'm about to go on the show. <laughs> and I said, OK, all right, all right, I hear that. Um, but let me ask you, Bob, look around you. Can you see a light somewhere? She said, he says, yes. I said, well, can you go over to that light? She said, he doesn't want to. He's angry, and he's furious, and he wants to stay here. And I said, oh, dude, you can stay here. Just go over near the light. So I got him to go over near the light. I had him put his arm through the light. I had him describe what that felt like. It's different. I said, look through that portal. You see anybody you know? He saw his uncle, the only person who liked him. I said, can we bring your uncle over here for a minute? And he said, OK. And then he said, I said, you can come back here. Dude, it's a portal. You want to come back? You can come back. But maybe you want to go talk to your uncle. He went, I'm going to stay with my uncle. I said, OK. And then they called me to go on the show. So I went off and I did the show. We didn't talk about that at all. But then after the show, I came back. Makeup artist said, he came back. And I said, oh, I guess it didn't work. And she said, no, no, he came back to thank us for helping him. Everybody is going to eventually get to the other side. They, if it's somebody's rabble-rousing here, it just means they haven't gotten there yet. Do we have to force them to go? Can we invite them to find, here's what I said to the guy, everyone you've ever loved or whoever loved you is on the other side of that light. Who wouldn't want to go see that? So just in terms of, of trying to parse like how that happened, the twins aren't responsible for it. The person who's no longer on the planet is responsible for it. Something. I, I interviewed once, I interviewed somebody, I said, why are you scaring this girl? Because it, it somebody had a memory when they were like nine years old of somebody really frightening. And he said, I don't scare people normally. I just come here to hang out. It's just, it's different here. I like it here. But it's not my fault she sees me. I'm just a pretty strong argument. <laughs> you know? so, so it's not their fault that this person showed up. It could be related to the house. It's likely related to the house. It could be related to them, whoever their parents were, you know, whatever. Moving furniture isn't necessarily a negative thing. It could be, I know this sounds weird, but like, oh, my kid's going to fall over that if I don't get that chair out of the way. I better move that. And then you hear, oh my god, the chair's moving. <laughs> As opposed to, 
Um, hello, Ghosty. I appreciate your presence here. Thank you very much. But I like the chair over there. And if we're gonna like, you know, have this relationship, you're welcome here. But you know, if you go beyond the light, everyone who ever loved you is on the other side. So go, come back, hang out. It's fine. But stop scaring the hell out. That's it. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you so much. I am the answer guy, aren't I? <laughs> I should have a talk show. Come on up. Mediumship. Okay. The question is going to be. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my mother died many years ago. She had a real hard life. Here. I'm sorry. Uh, nine children. I don't want to go into that. Nine shape. children? But not all her. She, oh. my father did some things. Oh, okay. They became my children. But, um, my father <laughs> did some things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, like so a good it, it, and bottom line, there was nine of us. But she had a real hard life. Yeah. And uh, when she first died, I would, I had a lot of dreams about her, like she was there with me, telling me things. And I would actually wake up and I said, was that real or was that a dream? And you know, and this was a lot for about a month. Yeah. And I haven't heard from her since. What's your mom's name? What? What's your mom's name? Oh, Eugenia. 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 She's Spanish. Eugenia. Eugenia. That's it. Eugenia. And what's your name? Laura. Laura. But my middle name is Eugenia. Flora Eugenia. Beautiful. Um, well, here's how you can explore it. I would say this, you know, usually when people pass away, they're still figuring out, uh, I liken it to a um, chrysalis, you know, before you become a butterfly. You know, you got your caterpillar, and then your caterpillar turns into this weird thing, and then, ah, out comes the butterfly and flies away. But the chrysalis is still there. And of course, we build monuments to chrysalises, you know, do a lot of stuff on chrysalis. But we ignore the butterfly. But generally, the butterfly kind of sticks around for a while. They go, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm okay, everything's fine. And what she was getting, I would just say, from what you just said, Eugenia is saying, you know, I was telling you everything's okay. And after a while, it's like, okay, I, t I told you everything's okay. You don't have to worry about me anymore. I'm gonna go home and hang out, but every time you think of me, or say my name, or look at a photograph, this is what I recommend people do if they really want to communicate with somebody, yeah. take out a picture, because like the actual time of that photograph is in that space, that you can examine and sort of really put yourself there and, and ask your questions directly. It helps you to think of what their voice sounded like, and stuff like that, so my recommendation to you would, if you want to talk to her. I do. Okay, so I would say take a photograph of her, just take some time with it, and try to remember when it was taken, who took the picture, what the feeling of the sun was like, where the birds are around, where people laughing, what happened before, what happened after. It's like focused on it. Hear the sound of her voice. Very, like I said, it's very hard for them to what, talk, but they can put images. Then picture her sitting across from you in her favorite outfit and at the favorite age that she was in in her life, happiest. And just picture her looking at you and then, and then look very carefully. Is she wearing any jewelry? Is there anything on her? Do you know that piece of jewelry? Sometimes you find the jewelry is only that they put it on so that you remember it and you forgot it. But look at the color of their eyes Look at how they old they are. Just think about it, think about it, think. Allow that it's a game. Don't take it that seriously. If I don't hear anything, I'm gonna, you know, free. It's a game. But at some point, ask questions. And I would say you start with simple questions. And you can ask them to nod, shake their head, shrug, or no answer. Those are the four choices. I'm gonna ask you a question. Are you okay? And whatever comes to mind, if she goes, yes, or you'll hear her go, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? Why are you asking? I'm here. What? I'm just looking at her picture. Okay. So then you, so that you can make simple questions that you get yes, no, or I don't know answers to. But then you ask questions that you don't know the answer to. So when I say, Eugenia, who was there to greet you when you crossed over? What comes to mind? Very good. 
And now I'm going to ask A pain net, is this correct? Yes, no, shrug. What do you see when I ask her, was it your father that was there to greet you? Was that a surprise to you, Eugenia, to see your father, to see your husband? Yeah. No. No. You expected him to be there. Very good. What's the food that you miss about when their favorite food? What's the food that you I miss? Love. Yeah. Well, I loved her tortillas. Let's ask her. You want me to ask her now? Yeah, ask her. Let's ask her. Eugenia, what's the food that you like the most on the planet? What was the food that you like the most on the planet? What comes to mind? I can see the beans and the tortillas. Beans and the tortillas. Okay, very good. And you do that in terms of where, who are you hanging out with? Uh, these are not questions you, you, you sort of likely know because you've seen that, but some, eventually you're going to ask a question and she will answer it before you ask the question. So when I say, you know, who are you hanging out with, before I get to the who are, you'll see an image of somebody. But that's why you got to practice doing it. You keep doing it, keep doing it until yeah, that happens. Sure. Yeah, and eventually you're going to hear the answer before you can think the question. And it'll be like, wow, that's funny. Oh, I'll try it. It'll be great. Very good. Thank, Thank you, so you. Much. Thank you, Flora. Very good. Someone on this side. Does that make sense, everybody? Oh, Oksana, come on, you have a question. The fact that I remember your name is worth the question alone. <laughs> <laughs> Who died? Who's not on the planet that's my father? Your dad, okay. What's his name? Great name. And has he come to visit you? Uh, yes. Okay. So when did he come to visit you? Was it a dream or did you see him? Uh, the physical, uh, like when I saw him, it was when I was out of my body and I was thinking I was dying and he said, no, I'm not dying. Oh, very good. Okay, so just hold that thought. Did you hear that? So she was having an, uh, like a near-death event. She saw her father. She said, am I dying? And he went, no. <laughs> Sorry. No. All right. So this is an example. I'm just doing this as an example. How many minutes do we have? We got a few, don't we? Yeah, time. Okay, very good. I'm doing this as an example. Anybody can do this. I have no magical powers. She's not under hypnosis. I'm just showing you that asking questions to someone who's not under hypnosis is the equivalent of asking questions. So. And let's just see where we go. We may not get anywhere. We might not get anything. We might get something. But because you saw him in that altered consciousness state, it exists as a memory to you. So I'm going to ask you, when you saw him, was he standing or sitting? Sitting. Sitting. Was he, uh, how far away was he? Oh, this close. Okay, very good. I want you to do me a favor in your mind's eye, make it into a hologram, like a photograph, freezing, frozen, freezing, like a frozen photograph. And and that way we can move around it. Okay? okay. And so now tell me what what what's he wearing? Okay. But he can. So does he have pants does he have no clothes on or some clothes? Some clothes. Okay, some clothes. Does he have a shirt on or no shirt? He has a suit. Is it black, brown, gray, colored? Dark brown. Dark brown. And and uh, he has a suit on. Very good. Is there a, is there a three piece? Is it a vest? No. no. Take a look at his arms. Is there any any jewelry? A wedding ring? Just a watch. Just a watch. Thank you. Okay. Right hand, left hand. Uh, left, hand. left hand. Take a look at the watch. Take a look at it very carefully. What uh, what kind of band is it? Is it Leather band, okay. And can you see the name on the type of the face? Of the watch? Yeah. Luch. Luch. L O O C H? It's in Russian, L Y C H, but Luch. Yeah. Luch, okay, in Russian. Very good. L Y C H. Yeah. That word, that's that weird letter? Yeah. Okay, very good. And is this a watch that you remember him wearing? That's no, a watch. You get that? She has never seen this watch. I just asked her what her father was wearing. She described the watch. She has never seen it before. New information. I'm going to ask Anatoly. Where did the watch come from? 
put it in your daughter's mind. It was a gift. Would you show her who gave it to you, a male or a female? It's a gift from my mother to A gift from your mother. Okay, his mother. No, my mother. Your mother to him. Okay, very good. And so the reason you're on the totally put it in your daughter's mind why you're wearing that watch. Why would you want her to see this watch? Showing the time. Time. Very good. Thank you. So let me ask you, Anatoly, am I correct in saying that time doesn't exist or the time is relatively different on where you are? You say the time is it's different. It's moments. It's not this different. Exactly. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate <coughs> that. Did you know that Oksana was going to come today and that we were going to speak to you? Yes. He says yes. Does he say da or does he say yes? Uh, you know what? It just, it just says I understand. Yes, very good. It's just knowledge. So I'm going to ask you on a totally good good off. Oh, he's laughing. Did you hear that? I asked him a question in Russian and he laughed. Think about that for a second. Just really kind of contemplate what just happened. I mean, I sound, I sound excited about it, but you see, I asked him, are you ready? He knows what that means. Oksana I may know what it means, but it's, it's from the pioneers where it was like when you were a little kid, you used to say, you know, are you prepared for the Americans to come or whatever it's going to be? And the answer is, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to laugh so loud. What okay. do you want to tell your daughter? How is she doing? First, I want you to speak real specifically. Uh, he made me feel very happy. He's proud. Uh, he loves me. That unconditional love. Very good. Thank you. I'm sorry to make you here. Have some water. <laughs> um, uh, Anatoly, I appreciate you talking to us. Now, let's just hold on. This is not, we, we don't get a conversation like this too often. So, Anatoly, what can you tell the people in this room that they need to hear? What is it from your perspective where you are now? What would you like people to hear in this room? Uh, he makes me feel that we all have to have faith. We all have to have faith. And what do you mean by faith? Do you mean belief in each other? Belief in the flip side that people still continue to exist? He's focusing on this realm. On not this realm, other side, yes. not the other side. So okay. Like elevation, happiness, unity, trust. Elevation, happiness, unity, trust. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying we need to elevate ourselves and have trust in each other. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, very good. Are you saying that in relation to the political situation on the planet right now, or just in general humanity? In general humanity, I feel the soul element has to rise up. It's we have a good but it needs to give food to our soul. It needs to give food to our soul. I'm repeating it so that we can hear it as well as I can hear it so that I can think of whatever the next question would be. And Anatoly, who are you hanging out with on the other side? A lot of fun people. A lot of fun people. So tell us, like give Oksana an example of one person that he might be hanging out with that she would know. Uh, it's, it's a young man who died Is he a cousin or an uncle or a nephew? Cousin. A cousin. cousin. Yes. Let me ask you, Anatoly. I uh, people ask this question: Are you able to do some of the things that you used to do here? And sort of mentally create those things? Uh, you know, it's kind of like he's showing me that whatever he did here is fine, but he's an absolutely different. I understand. My question is: Are you drinking vodka? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, very good. So now I want to clarify that though, because people will be like, what? So what brand, What I'm just going to ask you, okay. Anatoly, is there a brand or is it your own homemade? Kind of homemade. It's homemade. Very good. And is it based on your memory of vodkas that you tasted throughout your life? Or is it something else? Is it a combination of somebody else helping? Yeah, it's something else. Something else. Okay, very good. And let me ask you, you don't get drunk, do you? No. So, able to drink vodka, not able to get drunk. Isn't that interesting? Do you smoke cigarettes? Yes. You smoke cigarettes, so uh, but I guess that's okay. Is there anybody in this room you have a message for beside Oksana?
There is an individual, he's saying. Boy or girl. A man. Young or old. Middle. What does he want to say to Troy? Is that your name? Tell me yeah. your name. Troy. It could be Troy. It could be this fella. It could be you. Anatoly wants to say something. <laughs> what do you want to say? Anatoly, I'm going to point. Is it this direction? I think this direction. Okay, is it Troy, the film guy in the back row? Yes. Dude, yes. sorry. I'm sorry. I just met you, but here we are. We're talking to somebody on the flip side. He's got a message for you. What do you want to say, Anatoly? There is a lot of work. There's some kind of work. That's there is some kind of work that you're doing. Is that correct, Anatoly? Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's There's work that you're doing that needs to be shown to the planet. Is that correct? Yes. All right, thank you. That's what I'm hearing. It's not what you're doing now, it's going to come from it. It's not what you're doing now, it's going to come from it. Yes. You understand what he's saying? Yeah. It's very powerful and it's very solid. It's very it's powerful and it's very solid. Very solid. Like it's going to be a very strong work. Very strong work. Message and... Message. Yeah. yeah Should he tell this to the filmmaker he's working with, the, the person, or does it matter? It's, it's will come from his it will come from you, Troy. Wow, dude, I'm sorry. You know, listen, this is, we're not doing a mediumship show here. You know that. Oh, I, knew I, he just, was, I knew he was going to ask me a question before you even said anything. Wow. How weird is that? I don't know why I suggest I've never done that before. I've never, ever asked somebody if they have a message for somebody in the room. Never. So the fact that he would put that in my mind so that he could mention to Troy that what the kind of work that he's doing is important is really bizarre. And the fact that I even called you to come up here is just came out of the fact, you know, the fact that you helped me with the camera, big deal, you know, but I mean the idea that uh, something needs to be said. So Anatoly, we appreciate you coming uh, to visit us. Thank you very much, my friend. And you're always welcome, of course, to visit with your daughter. Is there anything else you want to pass along? <laughs> Which means always prepared. So that was the thing. You'd say, "Good good off," right? I don't yeah. pronounce it correctly, and then the answer is "Sigdagadov." I am always prepared. Yes. Thank you, Oksana. Thank you so much. Wow, that was wild. <laughs> nice to meet your dad too. Thank you. How cool was that, <laughs> Janet? Are you just a little impressed? <laughs> <laughs> I have one more person and we're going to close with that. But before we do that, I want you to know that we do have copies of some books. Those books. are the only books that 20 we bucks have each. today. Uh, $20. Uh, see me over there. Um, <laughs> and the one person I'm going to have come up is Jerry. That was wild, Oksana. That was trippy. I love that he showed you that watch, too. Yeah. I just want to tell you because this is, come on, sit. This happened once before when uh, I was talking to a girl and she was telling me about her father's watch. I just asked, was there any detail? This was like we were doing laundry in my building. And, uh, and she said, I've never seen this watch before. And I said, you know what? I'm getting a sense that you have it somewhere in your house, a photograph of it. He's showing me the photograph. And then she texted me like an hour later. She went through her stuff and found the photograph yeah. of him wearing that Timex that she had never seen before. Oh, so the watch, yeah. watch is about time. It's the same thing that the other guy was saying. It's mm -hmm. about time. Like, don't take time so seriously. Yeah. I love that. I do too. Okay, man. <laughs> Good. What's going on? What can I, who can Great. we talk to? What do we need? Who died? Who, uh, what was the most profound interview that you've done? On the flip side, um, God, that's, that's a great question, and I, you know, I, I run, I run through the, the. Uh, I'll tell you the one of the probably the. I'll give you two. One is Stephen Hawking. So when he passed away, I thought, well, I don't know Stephen Hawking, and I know Jennifer doesn't know Stephen Hawking, but let's see if we can get Stephen Hawking in here. So I, we invited him in, and everybody was like happy to see him, and you know, he wheeled in. And then he got out of his chair. 
Wow. And then, and he was about 28 years old, and, and we had this conversation with him. And a friend of mine also did an interview with him about the same time. And she described the same answers that he gave. And, and then since then, we've had, I've had conversations with him, with Jennifer, asking about black holes and our things called the portals. He said, but not in the way you think. I don't know what that means. Portal, but not a portal portal. I think he means, you know, matter transfers. We also asked him about dark energy, because that apparently, if you dissolve that one, you get a Nobel for that, which he gave us an answer to. So that was, you know, intellectually, it was interesting, because I invited four atheists to that. I invited Carl Sagan. I invited uh, uh, Nikola Tesla. And I invited um, Hawking and my Einstein. So these four guys, and I gave them each different questions. You know, solve this, solve that. And you know, I'm not a scientist. No, I don't know if their answers are accurate, but they're fascinating. But probably the most profound was uh, an actor named Harry Dean Stanton. You're welcome, Harry. So Harry Dean Stanton was somebody that I knew through Luana. Luana had introduced me to him over the years, and over the years, I actually did a Laverne and Shirley with Harry Dean Stanton. Go ahead, look it up. Um, and so I'd known him, and I'd gone out to dinner with him many times. Uh, he used to love to go to Dan Tana's. Harry could really put it away. So when you sat down with Harry, it meant you were not going to drive home. But he was, he was notorious for being a curmudgeonly uh, atheist. You know, there is no afterlife. They made a movie called Lucky, where he talks about it. There is no afterlife. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to do Harry. But he was an adorable person, just really sweet. And everybody that knew him just loved him. So when he passed away, I thought, well, this will be a fun way. I knew Jennifer didn't know who he was. So I said, I want to talk to my friend Harry. She said, oh, he's here. I said, so Harry, you know, what's it like for an atheist to realize you're in an afterlife? And he started swearing, you know, and saying, you know, <laughs> stupid question. And then he said, Luana, Luana gave me a soft landing. And I said, what does that mean? He said, she showed up in my hospital room. He said, uh, I said, describe what happened. Describe your death. He said, there were five women around me. And then as I died, Luana was there. I saw her beckoning me. I said, describe how she looked. He described her dress in like a 60s outfit. When he knew her, when they first met, back in the 60s. And he said, and then there was a baby. I said, who was the baby? He said, the baby was a miscarriage my girlfriend had in 1962. I said, okay. I have no way to verify any of that. But I said, so how did Luana give you a soft landing? He said, because I was always under the belief that when you died, you fell into a dream. And then that was the afterlife. It was just a dream. Like, and this was a happy dream. And so I was in a car driving with her. Jennifer's saying, they're driving somewhere. They're driving up the coast. And he's, she's saying they're going to, uh, it looks like a concert of some kind, Monterey Pop Festival 1967. I happened to see that movie a month earlier. And I texted a friend, a mutual friend, Luana and me, and I said to this film producer, Fred Roos, who produced all the Godfather films, I said, Fred, did, did you, did Luana go to the Monterey Pop Festival? I'm, I'm remembering that. And he said, yes, I went with her. He said, there were three people in the car. It was me, Luana, and Harry Dean Stan. So now, here it is a month later, I'm talking to Jennifer, and she's saying, he's showing me three people in a car. Luana's in, you know, sitting here, and there's a guy driving, and his name is Fred. That's my friend, Fred Roos. But Fred's alive. Remember? Two-thirds of your energy is always back there. So Harry is describing Fred Roos driving, Luana in the car. And I said, so when did you realize it wasn't a, it wasn't a dream? He said, when we got a flat tire. He said, we, I got out to fix the flat tire. And I looked at Luana, and I said, wait a minute. We didn't have a flat tire. And she looked at him and said, I know. That's when he realized he was on the flip side. And then I said, well, tell, show Jennifer who you went to see, the Monterey Pop. She, and Jennifer said, I'm seeing Prince. He's funny. Prince is playing. I said, let's look carefully. Oh, it's Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> and then, so then I called Fred Bruce on the phone. I said, Fred, tell me. This is before his memorial service. I said, Fred, tell me. 
did you get a flat tire on that trip? He said, no. I said, who did you see when you got there? He said, Jimi Hendrix. I said, okay. So I said to Harry, look, your memorial service is next week. I'll probably go. What do you want me to say? He said, tell people to believe in the afterlife. I laughed. Harry, all your friends are skeptics. None of them are going to hear, listen to me go, well, I talked to Harry last week, and he said, there is an afterlife. He said, Richard, tell them to believe in the possibility of an afterlife, and then they won't waste any of their life arguing about it like I did. So he also gave me three things to tell people. Three different people at the memorial service. He said, go and tell so-and-so to get his prostate checked. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? You're going to ask me, yes, that's what you're going to do. Number two person, he said, go and tell this guy his uh, arthritis medicine is drying, his, uh, drying him out. It's going to hurt him. We'll start drinking water. And three, tell my girlfriend uh, that I love her and that I'm here waiting for her. Okay, Harry. So I go to the memorial service. They get up and they talk about there is no afterlife, there is no afterlife, there is no afterlife. <laughs> Jack Nicholson, Al Pacino, Warren Beatty. It was a very small group of big A-list people talking about lifetime stuff. Um, I went over to the first person and I said, I, this is going to sound weird, but I talked to Harry and he said, you need to get your prostate checked. And he said, I went for my first treatment this morning. Went to the second guy and said, you know, he says you got to start drinking water. His son, like, fell out of his chair. We tell him that every day. And I went to this girlfriend and I said, she says he loves you and he's waiting for you. She screamed. She said, I, she said, I knew it. I knew it. And then I asked somebody who was there when he died. I said, who was there with him when he died? And she said, well, there were five women in the room, exactly as he described it. And I said, did he say anything weird? And she said, yeah. He said, hand me the baby. There was no baby in the room. But Harry had already told me that he had asked for the baby. So since then, whenever Harry shows up with me and Jennifer, she'll say, oh, your friend from Big Love is here. That was the show that he was in most recently. And uh, with Paxton, of all people. That's, you know, we all connect it, all connects up. And he always, <laughs> he always comes through and say, you know, thank you, Richard. So-and-so is now in a complete tizzy, freaking out because they know that what you're saying is accurate and it's scaring the shit out of them. Great story. Very good. You asked. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. <laughs>